running short on time. We got about 10 minutes left. And, and, and I know Eleni has been, she's been really quiet. It's really great. I appreciate it, Eleni. I know this is a topic here you really want to talk about. You brought up the, the Hoffman abstract at ASCO. And, and really, when we think about what are the emerging promising therapies for prostate cancer for the future, um, lead us through where, where you think lutetium PSMA 617 is. So, so honestly, I like the comment. I appreciate that you've been quiet. Like, okay, okay, you tell me. <laughs> but no, uh, I think it kind of created the segue by Ben, who said, you know, the 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 fact that he considers alpharadin more more precise than not versus how Chuck presented it. And I think the next step is exactly that. It's the treatment that would be more precise and to the point with a radiopharmaceutical. So great segue. While we're waiting though for phase three trial data, they're probably gonna come uh, out in ESMO or uh, at least this year, hopefully. I think that this first look at the phase two study that was designed I, very elegantly and very smartly by Hoffman et al. gave us a first view of those men who are more far along in the disease course and, and, and gave us a promise of what may happen. So they actually looked at a randomized schema of men who had progressed through other approved agents, but had undergone PSMA PET and an FDG PET. I think that's pretty important. I don't know how feasible that will be in the future in this country, but they did both. And they looked at accruing men who had MCRPC and had concordance of both the PSMA PET and the FDG PET findings. So if there was discordance, let's say there was an FDG PET positive but negative on PSMA for that lesion, patient didn't go on trial. So more homogeneous population, I love that. And then they randomized. Let's go for the PSMA lutetium versus the cabacitaxel. And their, their primary endpoints was, was what will you expect from a phase two study? They're looking at the PSA, they're looking at RPFS. These endpoints were very well met. Secondary was OS. I don't recall if their data said, I think it was positive for that too, even though it wasn't mature. It was a first glance at their data set. But the, the important part was that it was a staggering response by PSA criteria to favor the use of PSMA lutetium versus what was the case for cabacitaxel that in fact, if you look at the number, it looked like it was underperforming. And to Chuck's point, it's because that is a not as precise treatment. So it might be more an all-inclusive disease approach to life. And that's why I like this study a lot. And, and it, it speaks to the fact that if you pay attention to the details, you might get to your, your point quicker. Fantastic, fantastic. Any any thoughts on that, uh, Chuck or Tonya? Uh, well, I, I think it's it's really a, you know a, a key finding uh, that uh, that the lutetium is uh, is uh, potentially hitting both of those themes, right? It's a targeted imprecision therapy, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, and you know I mean nothing you know, but also it speaks to whether or not, I wonder, patients are going to be more likely to be able to take uh, lutetium uh, PSMA uh, more than chemotherapy or would be willing to take it. Although I do have to say, I find cabazitaxel to be a relatively well-tolerated therapy uh, with regards to chemotherapy. Yeah. And I don't necessarily see us replacing one drug with another, but I do see, you know, that there'll be you know, patients that might be more responsive to one strategy or another. And I, and I think this is where some of our biomarkers would be helpful. Yeah. Um, obviously, you know, uh, the, the vision study is what we need to see. We don't have that data yet. We'll do another program when that comes on and uh, be able to discuss that. Um, but I, and, and it'll be interesting to see where the, the imaging falls for this, because we talked about PSMA imaging as a way of uh, looking for metastatic burden, but but now we'd be doing it differently. We'd be looking at it in terms of a biomark for selection. And, and, and Tanya, does that change how you think about using PSMA uh, PET if you're thinking about it from a, a, a biologic profiling rather than a uh, tumor burden perspective? 
Well, I think it's very exciting to view it as a theranostic where you can do the diagnostic and show the phenotype. This is a cancer that's expressing the target as opposed to all these genomic strategies where we're looking at what the DNA says. So there's something very appealing about that. I'm seeing the target in this patient and I'm going to apply the treatment. But I do worry whether the imaging component is, is going to be lost in the application of the agent. And I think really a lot of attention, as Eleni pointed out, to concordance and intensity of uptake and who does well might really be important in maximizing the impact of this agent, which we're all very excited to have added to our therapeutic toolbox. Um, but it, engaging its relative merit for an individual patient, I think we'll need to refine the, the biomarker. But if anything, that makes me more enthusiastic. You know, we always want to choose the best treatment for a patient. We always want to have a biomarker that helps us do that in a, a more scientific way where we're scientists at heart and, and data junkies a little bit too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I, um, I want to thank you all. This this has been a, a, a incredibly informative and, and rich discussion. Uh, I really appreciate everybody's input uh, and insights. Before we conclude, though, you could summarize what what you think are most important take home messages from from this session today. Yeah, well, obviously, we're seeing a lot of um, incremental progress and in, on a lot of different fronts. It's really encouraging. Uh, we're, we're, for the first time in my career as a medical oncologist focusing on castration-resistant prostate cancer, we're talking about people who are living so long that prostate cancer is fading a little bit as a cause of death for these patients. So, though, you know, when you talk about big shifts in our field, those, they don't happen overnight. But when you think about what we talked about on these types of uh, meetings five years ago, it's a very different situation. Um, and so that's really encouraging. Uh, we have a number of key studies coming underway. We have our first genomically guided targeted therapy that just got approved. Uh, so it's, it's a very exciting time. Uh, it's a challenging time because while we, while we get excited about uh, these new agents and their, and their ability to, to treat patients, we also get humbled by the fact that they don't always work in everybody. And even in the people in whom they do have efficacy, it's maybe not as long as we'd like. And so uh, I am inspired to continue to study the biology of this disease and its evolution in patients over time and how that can be applied to the population. And I'm always delighted to work with you, my colleagues, on these, on these projects. Awesome. Awesome. And, and Tanya, any closing thoughts? Well, I think bringing it back to the patient who's at the center of all of this um, it's so gratifying and important that these studies look at patient reported outcomes and take into account quality of life. And that has to be part of our discussion with patients when we're talking about these are the benefits and here's what you will experience. And there's that third component of financial toxicity and concern. So it becomes more complex in our jobs to try to guide patients through, but it is important for us to look at all those aspects so many great new treatments, patients are living longer, they're largely living better too. Um, and it's just uh, increasingly our job to help patients navigate uh, and translate what these studies show us into what they will experience, what their day-to-day -day life will be like and what it means for their life, not just now, what's their PSA now, but what is it five years from now and 10 years from now? Those are challenges for us, but I know we can rise to the occasion. Fantastic, fantastic. Eleni, any thoughts? I, I, I don't want to be repetitive. I just want to add one more point that I, I believe comes across from all of us. We, we all feel privileged and, and have had the opportunity to firsthand uh, try a lot of these drugs. And, 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 and in a way, we're also privileged in our practices being mainly in academic setting. So it is also our responsibility to reach out to the community and offer a hand of trying to get everyone on board because it, it will mean nothing unless it gets to every single patient out there. And I think that's, that's what we all agree on. Fantastic, fantastic. And finally, Ben, from the urology perspective. Um, no, I, I appreciate Lenny's comments there because I think the mission for us is really pretty clear. I think whether, whether as urologists you're deciding to treat these patients or not, we have to be dedicated to finding them and um, understanding that these options are available for patients and that they're 
better when 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 we identify them as early as possible um, and get them on the right road. So I, you know, I think um, being and and also I'm very fortunate that I get to dedicate my time and and efforts to this. Um, but a big part of what I'm trying to do is is help my partners make sure that we're finding these patients and, and offering all the therapies that, that they can have. Because it doesn't do anyone any good if, if uh, the patients aren't getting to the therapy. So um, I, I really appreciate the discussion. It's, it's been very enjoyable. And, and uh, you know, I, I look forward to, to, to future talks. Fantastic. Fantastic. And thank you all again. And to our viewing audience, you know, we hope you found this Onc Live peer exchange discussion to be useful and informative and uh, look forward to having you join us again in the future. Thank you.